But I do obviously, I've, I've been reading about the show, but it's kind of a unique idea, it sounds like. Uh, are you going to ruin our childhood images of sci-fi movies? Walk me through what you're doing exactly. <laughs> no, I'm not going to ruin that. I'm going to enlighten you. Okay. <laughs> That's a different different comparison there. So uh, one of my favorite topics to talk about in any social setting, but especially in a theater setting where thousands of people are there, is just my observations of how science is addressed, treated, invoked in the storytelling of cinema. And it's it, it manifests not just in sci-fi films. Um, there are other films that I talk about. <clears throat> Um, there's so let me back up. So yes. the two kinds of films I will address: those that try to get the science right and then mess up somewhere. I'm, I'm going to call that out. All right, out of respect for their effort for trying to get it right, I, I'm obligated to do so. And then there are the movies that don't care about science but happen to get some right. And don't I like that? And I like and I want to give credit where credit is due where they throw in a little bit of science when they didn't have to and so they're like i said they're traditional sci-fi movies like armageddon which violates more laws of physics per minute <laughs> than any other film <laughs> no actually that was true until the movie moonfall came out during covid with halle berry i think that one wins that contest uh, but there are other films you just wouldn't have thought about Perhaps uh, I bet there's the science in in the Wizard of Oz or in Mary Poppins or in Frozen or uh, there are Pixar movies that where they actually uh, they'll ignore some science on purpose and get other science exquisitely correct. And it's just fun to go in there and celebrate it. There's also some in in Harry Potter. All right. Is there science that we can talk about embedded in all the magic that they perform? And, so it's a fun romp. I, well, yeah. I think it's fun. <laughs> and in, in some cases, in many cases, I mean, in some cases, they're just making no effort and they're looking silly in the science probably. But in some cases, they're obviously doing supernatural stuff that can't really happen, right? So it's hard to have science truly match that, isn't it? In some cases with what they're trying to have. Well, yeah, you got to give them some, you got to give them some slack either because they needed it or wanted it. I, I'm not that guy who's, oh, that couldn't happen. Oh, that wouldn't. I'm not that guy. Just make this clear. Uh, I I will comment if they could have told a better story had they gotten their science correct. All right. I, I can, if I can just give a quick example in yes, Star please, Wars, please. in Star Wars: The Force Awakens, Star Wars Seven, I think that was. Uh, there was a new diabolical Death Star that could park up next to an actual star, suck out all of its energy, so that star then disappears, and now. It has the energy not just to 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 obliterate one planet; it could obliterate all the planets of a star system. Okay, so that's diabolical. That that's good. I mean, good for the bad people, right? Mm -hmm. But then you think about it; it's like first, why would you want to completely obliterate a planet? Don't you want the planet afterwards? <laughs> I mean, so militaristically, that's stupid. But holding that aside. And holding aside the fact, see, I'm going to cut them some slack here. If they sucked all the energy out of a star into their vessel, their vessel becomes a star, all right? But, so let's ignore that complication, all right? So now, if you do the math, how much energy is in a star? It could obliterate 10,000 planets, not just the seven or eight that's in the star system that they that they they famously showed getting obliterated with these lasers coming out. So... Uh, that the 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 dark side could have been way more powerful than portrayed, and that disappoints me in the storytelling. How much does it disappoint you? And what I mean by that is, when we think of it, you know, it goes beyond pop culture. Obviously, a lot of people make judgments and think about stuff through what they see in media and movies. Uh, is it how important is it that how helpful would it be if science was better addressed in movies? Oh, I don't. I think that's an overstated concern. Okay. Uh, I think if people are thinking about science at all, even if some of it is misrepresented, uh, if it says that's an interesting phenomena, let me go do some homework on that or do some research or get take uh, get out get a book, uh, maybe one of my books <laughs> or or documentary. Uh, so I view 
these forces as, as uh, things that can stimulate further curiosity. You don't go to a sci-fi movie to learn how science works. That, but by the way, if they get good science in it, that's good. If there's a TV series, The Expanse, which describes different cultures and civilizations in our solar system, in the asteroid belt, on Mars, on Earth, on, uh, uh, and they all evolve differently to accommodate their different uh, habitats. And that's interesting conversational points that I think are worth exploring. And good science fiction will do that. So when you say you're calling them out, you're doing it with a smile, not a elbow to the ribs, I guess I would say. Uh, uh, so here's my analogy. Suppose you saw a period piece, um, and it takes takes place in like 1958, let's say. And then you have a friend who's a car expert, and they that friend sees a 1962 Chevy Bel Air parked in the street and says, oh, they messed that one up. That that was not around yet. That the fin size or whatever. And you say, hey, you know your cars. Or if you have a costume designer who sees a, a Jane Austen period piece and someone gets off the carriage and they're wearing a top hat rather than a derby. And apparently in that 20 year interval, uh, derbies were in style. They say, nope, they wouldn't have worn that. You say, hey. So why do they get your 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 accolades for knowing such things? Yet you come to me and say it's just a movie. Just get out. <laughs> so I'm just I just want to be treated fairly in this exercise. So walk me through the show specifically when people come. I mean, are are you sitting on stage? Are you bringing in video clips? How is this going to work? Yeah, that's, thank you. That's a great question, of course, because like people are coming, taking out a night of their lives to listen to an astrophysicist talk for two hours okay so i'm not unmindful of how weird that is or how weird that sounds so uh it's a it's a full presentation i have i i checked the latest count somewhere between 30 and 40 uh media clips uh, 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 movie clips and it also includes some remarkably scientifically literate beer commercials <laughs> So you'd be surprised where there's interesting science where somebody thought about it. Well, people I take beer seriously, credit. some people. <laughs> so we sit back and just in, in, enjoy. Uh, and by the way, the, the movies are organized by scientific theme. So there is, you know, space time or time travel or uh, thermodynamics. You know, how do they treat the flow of heat? in these scenes and did they get it right where do they get it wrong the matrix for example they get some of that wrong and i i you know uh, so it it's it's a it's a celebration of the attempt of creative people to put science in their in their in their craft and uh, i lead off with a quote from mark twain which is directly towards creative people and it says first get your facts straight then distort them at your leisure <laughs> And that that's the that's the lesson plan here. Fair enough. While I have you here, I want to pick your brain a little bit. Uh, what's what's think like a parent here? For example, I have two kids. Uh, I would describe one of them in love with science. The other one sort of tolerating it. They're a freshman and a seventh grader. What's your advice for a parent to sort of light that switch, light that candle? Because we know science is so critical. Uh, I mean, it would be great if they if they really embrace it with their with their futures. I mean. That's an excellent and very important question. And often, but, but I would invert the question. So I wouldn't say, what do we need to do to stimulate the curiosity in our kids? I would invert that and say, what do you need to do to make sure their native curiosity as children does not fade? Okay, this is a different fact. But and they want to know, keep using the knowledge. It, we all know kids are curious. All right, they're looking under rocks. Where they're curious to the point of risking their lives. So you have to like chase after the two and three year olds so they don't die by the curiosity. Oh, what happens if I put a fork in the in the, in the outlet? You know, <laughs> it's like so so so. These are important facts. So what you need to do as a parent is rather than squash that curiosity, because so much of that curiosity manifests as disorder in your household. Okay. The kid goes up to the, the, the cabinet, you know, the lower cabinets is where your big pots are typically. And they pull out the pots and start banging on them with spoons and things. And you don't want the pots to get dirty and they're making a racket. So you say, 
quit, quit the racket, quit, blah, blah, blah. and you're angry as a parent or frustrated as a parent. Whereas, have a different outlook and say, my child was doing experiments in acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> what does a wooden spoon sound like versus a, an aluminum spoon on a, a cast iron versus, you know, and let that experiment run through. You didn't have kids so that you would maintain a neat household. All right. That is, these two do not comport. All right. So recognize this. And then if you celebrate or allow that level of uh, manifested curiosity in your household, you'll have a messy home, and but their curiosity will be deeply embedded and it'll stay with them for their lives. In other words, sometimes we're not thinking about it in these terms, but we're squashing maybe an interest they have in something and without realizing it. Without even realizing, correct. And uh, so I think of this as kind of free range children. Uh, let them explore. And uh, oh, by the way, I... Uh, I, something I did with my kids, I, you know, they have such delicate little fingers back when they were little, of course, and you don't want fingers caught in doorways and things. So I held up a pencil next to one of their fingers and it was about the same width. Then I put the pencil in the doorway and slammed the door and the pencil shattered into two bits, right? And they never put their fingers in the doorway ever again. So these are experiments. You want to keep them safe, of course, but no, they're not playing in the doorstop, uh, after that. And it's a, a demonstration of the forces of nature can also be quite um, uh, illuminating, as we say. Well, Neil, thank you so much for your time. This has been uh, illuminating for me. It's been uh, great to talk to you and uh, have a have a good trip when you come to Kalamazoo later this month and have a great show. Excellent. And I'm obligated to say that if I were to rate the show, yes. um, because I'm showing movie clips, I would say PG-13. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I, I'll use a word or two that I'm pretty sure kids have heard their parents use around the house. <laughs> but other than that, if you have precocious kids, that it'll work for them for sure. Okay, that's some great advice to hear. Yeah. Well, have a wonderful show when you're in town, and uh, we look forward to it. And thank you for giving us uh, Derek Cheater. Um, oh, <laughs> wow, you looked us up. I like that. <laughs> no, not I do. I'm native New Yorker. We know where yes. our people come from. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Neil, it's great to, great to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me.